I'm pleased to bring the Criminal Procedure Bill 2021 before the House. It's a relatively short bill whose primary purpose is the introduction of preliminary trial hearings. The need for these hearings has been agreed and their implementation has been called for for many years. The programme for government highlights the introduction of legislation to provide for preliminary trial hearings as a priority and a number of reports have highlighted their potential benefits. This includes the expert group on Article 13 of the European Convention on Human Rights or the McDermott Report from 2013, the Report on Efficiencies in the Criminal Justice System, the Fenley Report from 2012, the more recent review of protections for vulnerable witnesses in the investigation and prosecution of sexual offences or the O'Malley Report, and then most recently the review of structures and strategies to prevent, investigate and penalise economic crime and corruption or the Hamilton Report. Victims in particular have spoken about how difficult it is for them when they have mentally prepared for a trial and it doesn't go ahead or how upsetting it is if something unexpected is brought up during the trial that results in interruptions while difficulties or arguments are dealt with by the court. While we can't take away from the fact that a trial is obviously an adversarial process, that an accused person is entitled to defend themselves robustly and that events can unfold in unexpected ways. The introduction of preliminary trial hearings should make trials more predictable and help them run more smoothly. From the point of view of an accused person, if a trial is going to fail because of the inadmissibility of certain evidence, for example, this should be uncovered as early as possible to avoid the person being put through a full trial unnecessarily. Uncovering such difficulties at the preliminary hearing stage should mean the accused will not have to go through the trial process for a case that was inevitably going to fail. It is also in the interest of the jury that the information presented to them during the trial should flow more smoothly and without interruption, insofar as that is, of course, possible. These hearings should also reduce the length of trials, which, as we know, can be considerable, sometimes in part owing to repeated adjournments. Preliminary hearings will reduce delays. It will increase efficiency in how our criminal trials are run. They will allow the court to deal with many of the issues that currently arise during a trial, which require the jury to be excused. The judge can also use a preliminary hearing to deal with issues that might currently prevent a trial from going ahead on the day that it is supposed to, for example, problems with disclosure or a need for specific practical measures or technology. Preliminary hearings will not deal with matters which must currently be dealt with when the jury is present. In practical terms, the introduction of preliminary hearings will mean, firstly, that it's less likely that a jury will be sent away immediately after being sworn in or being sent away multiple times during the trial, which often happens. Secondly, there will be a reduced impact on victims, those who are likely to find the trial very stressful and will have prepared themselves mentally only for the trial not to start on the designated day or for it to be interrupted, potentially multiple times, dragging out the experience and making it more difficult. Thirdly, there will be significant resource efficiencies for trials already on the day they are due to start and more likely to proceed smoothly to a conclusion. And finally, matters which would ultimately prevent a case being submitted to a jury will now more likely be identified in advance, thus avoiding the panelling of a jury and subjection of a person to an unnecessary trial. These are important benefits which I believe will be supported, I hope, by all sides in this House and which will result in significant efficiencies in the criminal justice system. Let me turn to the bill itself now and outline what is proposed specifically. Part one of the bill is a standard part which gives the title, it provides definitions for some important terms used later throughout the bill, and it repeals some provisions in legislation which are being replaced by updated provisions later in the bill. Part two of the bill is the main part of the bill and it deals with preliminary trial hearings. The principal purpose of these hearings, as I've outlined, is to deal with certain matters ahead of the beginning of the trial, so as to ensure that the parties are ready to proceed on the day of the trial to minimise interruptions to the trial while it is in train. The judge can order a preliminary trial hearing for any indictable offence where they think it's needed. A preliminary hearing can also be requested by the prosecution or the defence where the trial is for a relevant offence as set out in the bill. And these relevant offences are firstly offences which carry a maximum sentence of 10 years or more. This includes a life sentence. And secondly, offences which the minister has specified by order. When specifying an offence as a relevant offence, the bill sets out what the minister must consider, including the nature of the offence concerned and the relevant complexities that generally arise in the prosecution of such offences. The court must agree to at least one preliminary hearing to a relevant offence, whether either the prosecution or the defence has requested it. The bill specifies the timing for a preliminary trial hearing, which must, must take place before the jury is sworn in, or in the case of trials in the Special Criminal Court, before the trial has commenced. It provides that if it is in the interests of justice, an accused may be arranged at a preliminary trial hearing. 
The bill also specifies the type of orders or decisions which may be made at a preliminary trial hearing. In relation to the matters that the court can deal with at preliminary hearings, the court can assess various case management matters and make orders or rulings to ensure the just, the expeditious and the efficient conduct of the trial. This includes in relation to firstly the availability of witnesses, secondly whether any particular practical measures or technology may be needed, thirdly the extent to which the trial is ready to proceed. This includes any long-standing issues with regards to disclosure, fourth how long the trial is likely to be, the bill also provides that the court can also make decisions or orders at a preliminary hearing in relation to whether a number of persons charged in the same proceedings can be trialled separately, amending an indictment under Section 6 of the Criminal Administrative Act 24, for example, to allow offences to be tried separately, under Section 15A of the Juries Act 76 to provide for additional jurors where the trial is likely to be long, allowing for evidence by written statement or proof by firm formal admission under Sections 20. 1 and 22 of the Criminal Justice Act 1984, and also an application to question the victim in a rape offence about their prior sexual history in accordance with Section 3 of the Criminal Law Rape Act 1981. It also looks at decisions around how evidence may be given from behind a screen, so via video television link, including from outside the state or via an intermediary under various sections of the Criminal Evidence Act 92, as well as whether cross-examination by the accused in person will be permitted and determination of issues around disclosure of the victim's counselling records in a sexual offences case under Section 19A of the Act. It looks at under Section 39 of the Criminal Justice Act whether a witness who is in fear um, or subject to intimidation may give evidence through live video link under section 67 of the criminal justice mutual assistance act whether a witness outside the state may give evidence by live television link leave to call expert witness under section 34 of the criminal procedure act 2010 it looks at under section 21 of the criminal justice victims of crime act where a victim needs to be protected from secondary or repeat victimization intimidation or retaliation whether to permit questioning or evidence about the private life of that victim and finally, it allows for evidence via video link under Section 25 of the Civil Law and Criminal Law Miscellaneous Provisions Act 2020. In addition to this lengthy list, at the preliminary hearing, the course may also make a relevant order, which is an order relating to the admissibility of evidence. Finally, in this part of the bill, there is a general power for the court to make any order that, the co that could be made in the absence of a jury or any order relating to the conduct of the trial as appears necessary to the court to ensure due process and the interests of justice are observed. So I think, as you can see, there are a wide range of important orders provided for in the bill, which will now be able to deal with and be dealt with at a much earlier stage in the proceedings, which will be to the benefit of all parties involved. It will not generally be necessary for the same judge who presides over a preliminary trial hearing to preside over any subsequent hearings or the trial of the offence. An exception to this, however, is a preliminary trial hearing dealing with the admissibility of evidence where, other than in exceptional circumstances, the same judge must preside over the hearing and the trial. There is also a general power in the bill for the court to decide that the same judge must preside over subsequent preliminary trial hearings and the trial of the offence if that is in the interest of justice. Orders made during a preliminary hearing will be binding. They may not generally be appealed until the conclusion of the trial. An application may only be made to vary an order if there is a material change in circumstances since the time at which the order was made. The only appeals that will be permitted between a preliminary trial hearing and the trial and the offence related to significant decisions, including or excluding evidence as inadmissible. And if such decision results in this case against the accused being very significantly weakened, then it is clearly in nobody's interest for the trial to have to proceed to a conclusion before the related appeal can be determined. Participants who would be entitled to legal representation and legal aid for the trial, they will have the same entitlements for any associated preliminary trial hearings. In general, preliminary trial hearings will be conducted in public. However, there is a power for the judge to exclude the public from any portion of or all of a preliminary trial hearing where that is necessary and to prohibit the publishing or broadcasting of certain details until the trial is complete. This may be necessary to protect the accused person's right to a fair trial, particularly given that the jury will not have been sworn in and material may be discussed at the hearing which should not be represented or presented to the jury, for example, evidence that is later ruled inadmissible. 
Part three of the bill deals with the provision of information to juries. This arises from a recommendation of the Law Reform Commission in its 2013 report on jury service that the type of information that is available to juries in complex financial trials should be extended to juries in trials for all indictable offences. This part of the bill implements that recommendation. Part four of the bill makes various small amendments to criminal procedure legislation. The changes in relation to evidence by written statement will allow the court to require a person objecting to the admission of written evidence rather than oral testimony to give their reasons for doing so and having considered those reasons to admit the evidence in written form where this is not contrary to the interests of justice. The other amendments are technical in nature or are just adjustments to existing provisions that are not necessary to reflect the introduction of preliminary hearings or that are necessary apologies. Uh, unless Ken Corley, the Criminal Procedure Bill 2021 contains important provisions which will enhance the powers of our courts in conducting efficient criminal trials. A better trial process is in the interest of everyone concerned, the accused, the victims, the courts and the members of our juries. The provisions of the bill have been carefully designed to try and strike that right balance to improve the criminal trial process in a way that has been sought after by many experts for many years. Thank you and I look forward to hearing the debate today.